Great apes, or hominids, are a taxonomic family of primates that includes eight extant species in four genera. Pongo, the Bornean, Sumatran, and Tapanuli orangutan, Gorilla, the Eastern and Western Gorilla, Pan, the common chimpanzee and the bonobo, and Homo, which includes modern humans and our extinct relatives, e.g. the Neanderthal, a subspecies of archaic humans who lived in Eurasia during at least 430,000 to 38,000 years ago, and ancestors such as Homo erectus. Homo erectus, or its immediate Australopithecine-derived ancestors, are thought to have first dispersed out of Africa and into Eurasia shortly after two million years ago, also known as Out of Africa I. Later waves of migration out of Africa may have occurred around 1.4 million years ago, early Acheulean Industries, and around 0.8 million years ago, cleaver-producing Acheulean groups. Anatomically modern Homo sapiens, most likely developed in the Horn of Africa between 300,000 and 200,000 years ago. There were several out-of-Africa dispersals of modern humans, possibly beginning as early as 270,000 years ago, and definitely from 130,000 to 115,000 years ago via northern Africa. A notable modern human presence first appeared during the Middle Pleistocene in Africa and started to establish continuous, permanent populations in Eurasia and Australasia from 120,000 BC and 63,000 BC, respectively, while an early offshoot settled the Near East and Europe less than 55,000 years ago and the Americas from 22,000 BC. The most significant recent migrational wave took place about 70,000 years ago via the so-called Southern Route, spreading rapidly along the coast of Asia and reaching Australia by around 65,000 to 50,000 years ago. The Toba Super Eruption was a supervolcanic eruption that occurred about 75,000 years ago, according to potassium argon dating, at the site of present day Lake Toba in Sumatra, Indonesia. This eruption was the last and largest of four eruptions of Toba during the Quaternary period from 2.588 million years ago to the present, and it is also recognized for its diagnostic horizon of ashfall, the youngest Toba Tuff, YTT. It had an estimated volcanic explosivity index of 8, the highest rating of any known eruption on Earth. The most common dense rock equivalent, DRE, estimate is 2,800 kilometers cubed, about 7 times 10 to the 15th kilograms of erupted magma, of which 800 kilometers cubed was deposited as ashfall. Toba's erupted mass deposited an ash layer around 15 centimeters, 5.9 inches, thick, over the whole of South Asia. A blanket of volcanic ash was also deposited over the Indian Ocean, 
the Arabian Sea, and South China Sea. Assuming an emission of 6 billion tons of sulfur dioxide, a maximum global cooling of approximately 15 degrees Celsius may have occurred for three years after the eruption. Evidence from Greenland ice cores indicates a 1,000 year period of low delta O18, a measure of the ratio of stable isotopes oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, and increased dust deposition immediately following the eruption. The eruption may have kicked off this 1,000 year period of cooler temperatures, stadial, the first two centuries of which may also be accounted for by the persistence of the Toba stratospheric loading. The Toba super eruption deposited a microscopic layer of glassy volcanic ash sediments in Lake Malawi, an East African Great Lake located between modern Malawi, Mozambique, and Tanzania, but nevertheless affected no change in fossil type there, suggesting, to some, that there was not a thermally driven overturn of the regional water column. The populations of the eastern African chimpanzee, Bornean orangutan, central Indian macaque, cheetah, and the tiger, all recovered from very low numbers around 70,000 to 55,000 years ago, indicating genetic bottlenecks in many species of mammals in the wake of the Toba eruption. Ancient stone tools in southern India were found above and below a thick layer of ash from the Toba eruption and were very similar across these layers, suggesting that the dust clouds from the eruption did not wipe out this local population. According to the genetic bottleneck theory, between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago, human populations sharply decreased to only 3,000 to 10,000 surviving individuals. It is supported by genetic evidence suggesting that today's humans are descended from a very small population of between 1,000 and 10,000 breeding pairs that existed about 70,000 years ago. The coastal root theory is primarily used to describe the initial peopling of the Arabian Peninsula, India, Southeast Asia, New Guinea, Australia, Near Oceania, coastal China, and Japan between roughly 70,000 to 60,000 years ago. The theory proposes that early Homo sapiens, some of the bearers of mitochondrial haplogroup L3, most likely similar to the Australoid populations of today, and hence dubbed proto-Australoids, arrived in the Arabian Peninsula about 70,000 years ago, crossing from East Africa via the Bab El Mandeb Straits. It has been estimated that from a population of 2,000 to 5,000 individuals in Africa, only a small group, possibly as few as 150 to 1,000 people, crossed the Red Sea. The group would have traveled along the coastal route around Arabia and Persia to India relatively rapidly within a few thousand years. From India they would have spread to Southeast Asia, Sundaland, and Oceania, Sahul. The Twelve Tools of the Craft are those given in Duncan's 1866 Ritual and Monitor as being the operative tools of speculative or free and accepted masonry. There are two tools listed for the first 
or entered apprentice degree, three for the second or fellow craft degree, and seven for the third or master mason degree. These tools are given moral meanings in the instructional lectures accompanying the craft degrees. However, they are essentially a collection of a few of the most ancient original tools invented by mankind. These twelve tools of the craft are as follows. The tools of the EAR, the 24-inch rule, and the common gavel. Those of the FC are the plumb, the square, and the level. The right proper tools of the MM are the trowel, the beehive, the hourglass, the scythe, the setting maul, the spade, and the coffin. A simple machine is a mechanical device that changes the direction or magnitude of a force. In general, they can be defined as the simplest mechanisms that use mechanical advantage, also called leverage, to multiply force. A simple machine uses a single applied force to do work against a single load force. Ignoring friction losses, the work done on the load is equal to the work done by the applied force. The machine can increase the amount of the output force at the cost of a proportional decrease in the distance moved by the load. The ratio of the output to the applied force is called the mechanical advantage. The following six simple machines are listed by Hero of Alexandria, 10 to around 70 AD, in his work Mechanica, preserved only in Arabic, written for architects and containing means to lift heavy objects. 1. The lever. 2. The wheel and axle. 3. The pulley. 4. The inclined plane. 5. The wedge. And 6. A screw. Lastly, we come to the four new inventions of the old world, more complicated devices using knowledge of more obscure and arcane physical principles and laws. These four inventions were 1. The sundial, 2. The compass, 3. The astrolabe, and 4. The battery. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day when there is sunlight by the apparent position of the sun in the sky. It consists of a flat plane, the dial, and a gnomon, which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines, which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. The style is the time-telling edge of the gnomon, though a single point or notice may be used. The gnomon casts a broad shadow. The shadow of the style shows the time. The gnomon may be a rod, wire, or elaborately decorated metal casting. The style must be parallel to the axis of the Earth's rotation for the sundial to be accurate throughout the year. The style's angle from horizontal is equal to the sundial's geographical latitude. 
A compass is an instrument used for navigation and orientation that shows direction relative to the geographic cardinal directions, or points. Usually a diagram called a compass rose, which shows the directions north, south, east, and west as abbreviated initials, is marked on the compass. When the compass is used, the rows can be aligned with the corresponding geographic directions. So, for example, the end mark on the rows really points to the north. Frequently, in addition to the rows, or sometimes instead of it, angle markings in degrees are shown on the compass. North corresponds to zero degrees, and the angles increase clockwise, so east is 90 degrees, south is 180 degrees, and west is 270 degrees. These numbers allow the compass to show azimuths or bearings, which are commonly stated in this notation. The magnetic compass was first invented as a device for divination as early as the Chinese Han Dynasty, since about 206 BC, and later adopted for navigation by the Song Dynasty Chinese during the 11th century AD. The use of a compass is recorded in Western Europe and in Persia around the early 13th century AD. An astrolabe, Greek astrolabus, star taker, is an elaborate inclinometer historically used by astronomers, navigators, and astrologers. Its many uses include locating and predicting the positions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, determining local time given local latitude, and vice versa, surveying and triangulation. It was used in classical antiquity, the Islamic Golden Age, the European Middle Ages, and Renaissance for all these purposes. In the Islamic world, it was also used to calculate the Qibla and to find the times for Salat, prayers. There is often confusion between the astrolabe and the mariner's astrolabe. While the astrolabe could be useful for determining latitude on land, it was an awkward instrument for use on the heaving deck of a ship or in wind. The mariner's astrolabe was developed to solve these problems. Some believe that wine, lemon juice, grape juice, or vinegar was used as an acidic electrolyte solution to generate an electric current from the difference between the electrode potentials of copper and iron electrodes in the so-called Baghdad battery type jars. By way of introduction, allow me to quote an extensive passage from the work Elongated Skulls of Peru and Bolivia by Brian Forrester the utmost expert at this time. The earliest evidence of artificial cranial deformation, ACD, comes from remains of the Mousterian people from Shanidar in Iraq and dates from the Middle Paleolithic period, approximately 300,000 until 30,000 years ago. It was already known in Byblos, an ancient Phoenician city, by 4000 BC, and in Georgia by 3000 BC, and was described by Herodotus, circa 460 to circa 377 BC, among the people who lived west of the Black Sea. It was a common practice in Eastern Asia, in what is today Malaysia, as well as Indonesia, Sumatra, Borneo, 
the Minahasa people, and in the Philippines. In southern Asia, it was common among the Brahui people in India, in the Punjab region in India and Pakistan, and in Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, and Baluchistan. Some have suggested that this practice became widespread with the Scythians. This people, pushed out by Chinese Emperor Xuan Wang, had to move from their original settlements in Central Asia towards southern Russia into and near the Crimean Peninsula in the 8th and 7th century BC. In their 4th century AD incursions, the Huns carried their cultural practices, including artificial head molding and newborns, to the whole of Central Europe and to the people who had to migrate toward Western Europe. As a consequence, artificially deformed skulls have been found all over the European continent, from Romania to Germany, mainly in Hamburg. Austria, Switzerland near Lucerne, Italy in Genoa and Padua. ACD skulls have also been found in Belgium, France, mainly in the Deux Severe and Normandy regions, and in the northern part of the UK. In Africa, skull deformation was commonplace in Nubia, supposedly in ancient Egypt. Akhenaten is believed by some to have shaped his daughter's heads during the 18th dynasty, yet no skeletal remains have been found. Among the Ashanti tribe in Sudan, other tribes of Central Africa, and until not long ago in the Republic of Congo, now Zaire. In Oceania, apart from Australia, it has been detected in Polynesia and Melanesia, especially the islands near Vanuatu. The practice of deforming the head in newborns was present in the whole of the Americas, from North America to Patagonia, mainly on the western side of the continents, and especially on the Andean Plateau of South America. In North America, it was carried out by the Bella Coola and Quagiuth of the west coast of Canada, the Flathead and Pueblo Indians of the United States, in Mexico by the Olmec, Aztec, Huasteca, and Maya, and in Central America among the Taino Indians. But cranial molding in neonates was most widely practiced in the Andean region from Venezuela to Guiana, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. The artificially deformed skull of a person who lived 6,000 to 7,000 BC was found in a cave in Uricocha in the Peruvian Andes. It was a common practice in the Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku state in the Titicaca Lake region in the Bolivian Altiplano, and numerous skulls have been found both at Tiwanaku and nearby Pumapunku. ACD was recorded among the Paracas people and Nazca people who lived in the south of Peru. The Paracas are known, though actual timelines are not well established, to have occupied what is now called the Paracas Peninsula and surrounding area as a distinct culture from about 1000 BC to 100 AD.
Otzi is the common nickname for the well-preserved natural mummy of a man who lived between 3400 and 3100 BC. The mummy was found in September 1991 AD in the Otstal Alps, hence the nickname Otzi, near Similion Mountain and Haslobjok on the border between Austria and Italy. By current estimates, at the time of his death, Otzi was approximately 1.65 meters, 5 feet, 5 inches tall, weighed about 61 kilograms, 134 pounds, and was about 45 years of age. Analysis of pollen, dust grains, and the isotopic composition of his tooth enamel indicates that he spent his childhood near the present village of Feldthurns, north of Balzano, but later went to live in valleys about 50 kilometers further north. Otzi's clothes were sophisticated. He wore a cloak made of woven grass and a coat, a belt, a pair of leggings, a loincloth, and shoes, all made of leather of different skins. He also wore a bearskin cap with a leather chin strap. Other items found with the Iceman were a copper axe with a U handle, a chert bladed knife with an ash handle, and a quiver of 14 arrows with viburnum and dogwood shafts. Analysis of Otzi's stomach contents revealed the partly digested remains of ibex meat, confirmed by DNA analysis, suggesting he had a meal less than two hours before his death. Wheat grains were also found. It is believed that Otzi most likely had a few slices of a dried fatty meat, probably bacon, which came from a wild goat in South Tyrol, Italy. Analysis of Otzi's intestinal contents showed two meals, the last one consumed about eight hours before his death, one of camoy meat, the other of red deer and herb bread. Both were eaten with grain as well as roots and fruits. The grain from both meals was a highly processed einkorn wheat bran quite possibly eaten in the form of bread. In 2001, x-rays and a CT scan revealed that Otzi had an arrowhead lodged in his left shoulder when he died, and a matching small tear on his coat. The discovery of the arrowhead prompted researchers to theorize Otzi died of blood loss from the wound which would probably have been fatal even if modern medical techniques had been available. Further research found that the arrow's shaft had been removed before death, and close examination of the body found bruises and cuts to the hands, wrists, and chest, and cerebral trauma indicative of a blow to the head. One of the cuts was to the base of his thumb, that reached down to the bone, but had no time to heal before his death. Currently, it is believed that Otzi bled to death after the arrow shattered the scapula and damaged nerves and blood vessels before lodging near the lung. Otzi had a total of 61 soot tattoos, consisting of 19 groups of black lines ranging from 1 to 3 millimeters in thickness and 7 to 40 millimeters long. These include groups of parallel lines running along the longitudinal axis of his body and to both sides of the lumbar spine, as well as a cruciform mark behind the right knee and on the right ankle. 
and parallel lines around the left wrist. The greatest concentration of markings is found on his legs, which together exhibit 12 groups of lines. It has been speculated that these tattoos may have been related to pain relief treatments similar to acupressure or acupuncture. If so, this is at least 2,000 years before their previously known earliest use in China, circa 1000 BC. Recent research into archaeological evidence for ancient tattooing has confirmed that Otzi is the oldest tattooed human mummy yet discovered. But he is not alone. On the remote Yukok Plateau, some 2,500 meters up in the Altai Mountains, in a frontier region close to Russia's borders with Mongolia, China, and Kazakhstan, accessible now only by helicopter, is what was once part of the Southern Steppe Road. Some 2,500 years ago, this way was used by the Pazarek people, who were a nomadic people described by the Greek historian Herodotus. Genetic studies show that the Pazaraks were a part of the Samietic family, with elements of Iranian Caucasian substratum. A 1929 archaeological expedition's tumulus excavation thawed out of ancient ice a female mummy buried with six horse skeletons, some with preserved wooden decorations on the harness, some with colored saddles made from felt. On one of the saddles was a picture of a jumping, winged lion. The woman had died in her mid to late twenties, around 2,500 years ago, making her a contemporary of Pythagoras and Buddha and her organs had been removed to preserve her artificially mummified body, which was filled with herbs and roots. Her head was completely shaved, and she wore a horsehair wig. She was dressed in a long shirt made from Chinese silk, and had long felt sleeve boots with a decoration on them. Chinese silk was only found in royal burials of the Parzak people. It was more expensive than gold, and was a sign of extreme wealth. There was jewelry and a mirror found by the foot of a massive, upright, hollowed wooden log central to the burial chamber. Laid out was a meal of sheep and horse meat, and ornaments made from felt, wood, bronze, and gold, including a small container of cannabis, along with the stone plate on which were the burned seeds of coriander. Bolon Yokti is usually deciphered to mean Bolon, nine, Ya, indicating plural, Oak, foot, te, tree. He was a character in Mayan mythology relating, usually, to the 13th Bacton event they predicted would occur on 12-21-2012 AD. For example, Bolon Yogde appears at the site now called Tortuguero, about 35 miles west-northwest of Palenque in southernmost Mexico, on Mayan Monument 6, erected around 670 A.D. This stele fragment reads, in part, The 13th Bacton will be finished on 4 Ahu, the third of Wienel, Kankin. Passage fragmented. Will occur. 
it will be the descent of the nine support gods to the passage fragmented. Another nearly identical, though more complete, inscription mentioning Bolognote is on the Comal Calco brick, and it reads, The 13th Bacton will be finished on dawn for Ahu, third Kankin. Then, what will occur will bring a revelation of the ninth Aeon event, Balam Yakte Kun, to all the ends of this world. <laughs>